Hello, and welcome to this periodic podcast for the Syracuse Intellectual Property Law Institute webinar series. Uh, this is Professor Shuba Ghosh from Syracuse University College of Law, uh, and I'm very happy to have with us uh, Professor Sam Ernst from the Golden Gate University School of Law. And this is part of the webinar series that accompanies this book. I think it's the first time I have a hard copy that I can show people. Forgotten, uh, Sam has one as well. <laughs> Forgotten Intellectual Property Law, a lore. Um, just came out from Elgar, available on Amazon on Elgar's website. And uh, Sam is going to talk about his uh, chapter, which is titled Radical Patent Law Reform in a Common Law Enabling System, a Meta History. So welcome, Sam. I know you have some slides and we look forward to your, your presentation and we'll hopefully have a little bit of a discussion as well. Yeah, thank you, Shuba. Um, it's, it's, um, it's an honor to, to have been involved in this project and uh, it's a great project, I think. The, uh, chapters are all really excellent from scholars around the world. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my chapter. Uh, I was rummaging around the other day and I found this old photo um, of the origins of this book. Uh, as you know, and I think you've talked about in the other podcasts, uh, Shuba, you invited us in two, 2017, you invited um, seven scholars to come to a symposium in DC for the Syracuse Law Review and talk and write about forgotten IP cases. Um, and that was mostly uh, or wholly, um, you know, uh, US cases. I wrote about Westinghouse versus Boyden, the reverse doctrine of equivalence. And there was Brian Fry who talked about the patent of a, of a slave, patents by slaves, Bruce Boyden of Marquette, Robert Braunice of George Washington, Jessica Kaiser of Gonzaga, Amelia Reinhardt of Utah, and Zvi Rosen, who I think was also involved with the origins of the project, who's at uh, Southern Illinois University. And it was a great time. And then you had, uh, Shuba had the idea for this book, a book on the similar topic, but now broader intellectual property lore and history. And this time with chapters by professors from all over the world. So more of a comparative treatment um, and not just limited to cases, uh, talking in addition about lore. Uh, and so for my contribution, I thought I would write something on a broader topic than one case, but I am not an expert in any law except US law and mostly patent law. So I recall once on Facebook in the wake of one of the you know, horrific mass shootings in this country with some recommending that uh, teachers, school teachers go into classrooms armed like soldiers. I posted and boasted uh, on Facebook, I will walk into the classroom armed with nothing except my knowledge of the patent law. And Shuba in his, with his dry and subtle wit commented, you mean armed with your knowledge of a patent law? Um, and yes, I only have knowledge of a patent law, US law, and it's less knowledge than many. So what was I going to do for international, a book of such international scope? I thought maybe it would be interesting to write about how legal reform, patent law reform, reform occurs in a common law system. Perhaps in contrast to a more heavily codified civil law system, although I'm not an expert in civil law and I know scholars there write about how judges actually do a lot more work in interpretation than we might believe. Um, so in particular, in the US, however, in the context of patent law, the Supreme Court has affected radical patent law reforms throughout our history, much more so in my opinion than Congress has. And the way they do this is by selectively and reviving cases from sometimes as much as a hundred years prior, cases that have been forgotten and disregarded. So forgotten patent law cases are the grist for the Supreme Court's patent law reform mill. All right, and this got me, so you can see there in the, in the diagram, there will be a, a period of Supreme Court patent law reform when there's a perceived abuse of the patent system, followed by inactivity and then another period of perceived 
abuses of the patent system. Uh, for example, uh, some people talk about thickets or non-practicing entities, and it depends on your perspective, but it's at least perceived, right? Congress failing to act, and then litigation campaigns um, in the Supreme Court and in the uh, lower courts uh, to bring test cases and file amicus briefs and write articles about these abuses. And then the court selects, reconstructs, and reinterprets forgotten precedent to make a new era of patent law reform. So it's a cycle. And that got me to reading uh, the historiographer Hayden White from my alma mater, UC Santa Cruz. And I realized that in this way, judicial opinions are like histories because histories are similarly constructs of the past, consciously or unconsciously, that comment on the present. Historians cannot reconstruct the past, they can't relive it, so they're really literary works that select and draw upon original sources, which are themselves contemporaneous literary constructs of what actually happened. And they choose what to include, what not to include, how to reconstruct it, and to com on, comment on it and how to comment on what other historians have commented on the, on the past. So that it's a literary work written in the present that purports to have a dialogue with a reconstructed past in order to influence the future. And common law judicial decisions are precisely the same thing, right? You recite, the judge recites the facts of the case found by the lower court, which are themselves constructs of the past made through witness testimony and documents of what purportedly happened is filtered through examination, cross-examination, the rules of evidence. Appellate in opinions then reconstruct and recharacterize those facts again, and then determine which judicial precedent to rely upon, which to overlook, which to distinguish altogether, right? Even interpreting a statute using one of the many available tools of statutory construction, because words are not um, objective um, references or constant reference either. They're, they, are, they change with context, with interpretation in different time periods, um, or depending on how the judge wants to interpret the words. So the court um, reconstructs the past and um, draws on precedent from the past and then characterizes that precedent to tell a story about how the past, that precedent that was either correctly recalled by the lower court or forgotten or disregarded or incorrectly characterized by the lower court compels a decision on a current dispute to create a forward looking rule that will itself be torn down and reconstructed by future appellate courts. And this is how the Supreme Court has affected radical patent law reforms at several key periods throughout US history through this common law, what I call a common law practice. All right, some will suggest, they'll say, wait a minute, US patent law is not common law. Many recall the words of Judge Howard T. Markey, the first chief judge of the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in his article, Why Not the Statute? And Judge Markey wrote, the patent laws are entirely statutory. There is no common law of patents. And although I think Judge Markey was a great man and a great judge, I think that that statement is manifestly and self-evidently incorrect. It's at best correct only as a needling technicality. In practical fact, US patent law is mostly judge-made law. All right, and many people know this, but very briefly, the Constitution, of course, the US Constitution empowers Congress to grant patents. And pursuant to this power, Congress has from time to time passed patent statutes. The most important congressional enactment now in governing is the Patent Act of 1952. And most re recently, we had the America Invents Act passed in 2011. However, all of these statutes are largely drawn in very broad and vague terms giving very little details of what the substantive patent law actually is. So the courts through precedent provide the actual workable rules of patent law. 
So the Patent Act is called by U.S. scholars a, pat a common law enabling statute. Craig Allen Nard wrote, the Patent Code, much like the Sherman Act, is a common law enabling statute, leaving ample room for courts to fill in the interstices or to create doctrines emanating solely from Article III of the Constitution, Article III's province. Indeed, the common law has been the dominant legal force in the development of U.S. patent law for over 200 years. And in fact, the gaps in the statutes are so big that without this judge-made law, we would be wholly at sea with regard to the substantive rules of patent law. So for example, the infringement statute merely sta states, whoever without authority makes, uses, offers to sell, or sells any patented invention infringes the patent, but nowhere explains what is infringement and how is it determined. It's been left to the courts to develop a complicated set of rules governing how infringement is determined by one, interpreting the patent's claim language under complicated claim construction rules that are frequently evolving through precedent, comparing the claim language to the elements of the accused product or process, requiring that all claim limitations be present in the accused product or process. And this was not always sufficient to prove infringement as we can discuss, but four, unless under some another judge-made doctrine, the doctrine of equivalence, a different structure performs substantially the same function in substantially the same way to achieve substantially the same result, but not if there is some defense to equivalent infringement, such as prosecution history estoppel, itself a vastly complicated judge-made doctrine, the specific exclusion principle, reclaiming the prior art, and on and on. All of that is judge-made law, nowhere mentioned in the statute. And we can do the same thing with respect to other examples, and such as invalidity, obviousness, anticipation, inequitable conduct, damages. The statute only says that you're entitled to um, damages to compensate for the infringement, no less than a reasonable royalty. There are vast treatises filling in the law of damages. How do you calculate a reasonable royalty and lost profits and everything else? Okay. And not only does judge-made law fill in the gaping holes in the statutes, but the statutes themselves were all largely codifications of previously announced judge-made law. The Patent Act of 1790 was enacted against a patent custom existing in the new United States and in Great Britain. And Great Britain's statute of monopolies was largely a codification of existing British common law on patents. The first U.S. Patent Act was fairly short and simple. The Department of State would examine and issue patents and even fix their terms, and it left to the courts to develop the patent law in the context of litigation and disputes with the Patent Office. And the subsequent patent acts were again codifications of the judge-made law with some minor adjustments that had been subsequently developed, drafted in vague and broad terms, leaving it to the courts to make more common law which led to further codifications, all right? Even in cases where Congress has attempted to articulate a standard in the views of some to supplant the existing common law standard, the Supreme Court has often ignored such dictates, stating that this section was merely intended as a codification of our judicial precedents from before, for example, 1952. So for example, in the the Great Patent Act of 1952, it created the obviousness requirement. And it was thought by some that this would supplant the quote unquote invention requirement created by the courts, which many, including some authors of the act, thought was too malleable and unpredictable. The, the invention requirement was originally announced in 1850 by the Supreme Court in a case called Hotchkiss versus Greenwood and developed and modified by subsequent decisions. The court said that even if a patent is not anticipated literally by the prior art, um, the court should compare the claimed invention to the prior art. And even if it's not identically disclosed, the court should determine if it was an inventive leap, a true invention worthy of a patent. And this was seen as subjective by Sun, especially as it developed in subsequent cases by the Supreme Court and other courts, 
So the new statute in 1952 was supposed to supplant this judge made law with a new requirement, the obviousness requirement. And the statute says a patent may not be obtained though the invention is not identically disclosed in this um, disclosed or described as set forth in this title. If the differences between the subject matter sought to be patented and the prior art are such that the subject matter as a whole would have been obvious at the time the invention was made to a person of ordinary skill in the art. Well, this adds a little bit of meat to the bones, but not much. What does it mean to have been obvious? What is the test? The Supreme Court uh, first in Graham versus Deere began to flesh it out. You determine the scope and content of the prior art under complicated judge made rules as to what constitutes prior art. Determine the level of ordinary skill in the art, ascertain the differences between the art and the claimed invention. Against this background, determine the obviousness or non obviousness of the invention, and then consider certain non technical secondary considerations set forth in judge made law that might rebut a showing of obviousness. To the extent this test borrows from the new statute, because it requires determining the differences between the prior art and the claimed invention, this was already done in the Hotchkiss case. And in fact, the Graham court says explicitly, we believe this legislative history as well as other sources shows that the revision was not intended by Congress to change the general level of patentable invention. We conclude the section was intended merely as a codification of judicial precedent embracing the Hotchkiss condition with congressional directions that inquiries into the obviousness of the subject matter sought to be patented are a prerequisite to patentability. And so to even hear the 1952 Act, at least according to the Supreme Court, is a codification of their prior law. And even the Graham decision required further lawmaking because that fourth step, determining the obviousness of the invention is a circular black box. It provides no guidance on how a court is to do that. The court determines it is obvious by determining the obviousness of the invention. And so it takes further judicial decisions by the Supreme Court and the Federal Circuit, further judge made law on how to actually determine obviousness. For example, the Federal Circuit created a test that there has to be a teaching suggestion or motivation to combine the prior art before you can declare it obvious. This was overruled by the Federal Cir uh, by the Supreme Court, we think, um, in the KSR opinion, which instead provided various chains of reasoning a court can look to to determine whether it's obvious, market forces inspire a predictable result um, with, uh, with expected results, D uh, common sense, different chains of reasoning. So patent law, I would argue, is, is common law. We're dealing with a common law system. There are some important exceptions, right? Such as the creation of patent office procedures, such as inter partes review in the American Events Act, but the substance of the patent law is little different from common law. So what we've seen throughout history is that most of the major reforms in patent law come through occasional periods of Supreme Court engagement in the law and not through congressional in, um, action. And these are followed by periods of disengagement when there grows up perceived abuses in the patent system. So various scholars such as Christopher Buchamp and Stephen Usselman and Colleen Chen and others have written about how in the late 1800s, there were abuses of the patent system by non-practicing entities, what they called in those days patent sharks, or they were called who attacked railroads and farmers asserting claims to siphon off profits from the most powerful and profitable industry of the day, the railroads and against farmers with farm implement patents. Congress attempted but failed to act in the face of these patent abuses. Stephen Usselman writes in Regulating Railroad Innovation, if a small tribunal in the Senate could block railroads from securing a legislative remedy to their problems by altering the patent laws, a handful of justices on the Supreme Court might offer at least a measure of relief through their interpretation of the laws. 
But the Supreme Court did more than provide a measure of relief and more than interpret the laws. They invented whole, out of whole cloth powerful new doctrines to aid accused infringers. Patent exhaustion, the reverse doctrine of equivalence, the inequitable conduct defense, further development of the invention requirement, as we've talked about. Then a period of Supreme Court disengagement from patent reform. Then the antitrust era, the 30s and 40s, when patents were perceived as monopolies, noxious monopolies. And the courts created patent misuse and antitrust doctrines to check patents. They put a check on functional claiming. They made it easier to invalidate patents further by strengthening again the invention requirement to the point where one of the justices of the Supreme Court said, the only patent that's a valid patent is one that this court has not been able to get its hands on, All right? And then the great codification of the patent law, the Patent Act of 1952. And then in the 1970s, the perception of patent weakness, that patents were being invalidated too much and that this was hurting the economy hurting innovation, leading to economic malaise. Um, and this is probably too simplistic of a uh, idea to equate innovation with invention, much less patented an invention. And even if so, that, th that an economic recession would ha not have many complicated, multiple interrelated causes. Nonetheless, um, the Congress created a new court, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, a specialized patent law court, which was supposed to unify patent law such that a patent was not invalid under one standard in the Fifth Circuit and valid and under another standard in the Sixth Circuit to unify the law. But it was also perceived by some members of the patent bar and even at least by one of its subsequent members as intended to strengthen patent rights. And whatever the intention, that is exactly what the new court did in many ways, including the Federal Circuit made the issuance of permanent injunctions virtually automatic upon a finding of patent infringement without any necess necessity to show irreparable harm, as you would in other cases. The court made it more difficult to prove a patent invalid for obviousness by interposing inflexible rules such as the teaching suggestion motivation test, which I mentioned. The court watered down the patent eligible subject matter requirements to almost to nothing, allowing for the patenting of business methods, empty internet configurations and other abstractions. The court ruled that patent holders could evade patent exhaustion, which Shuba has written a book about patent exhaustion, the first sale doctrine, right? by uh, ruling that you can freely contract around patent exhaustion, even with contracts of adhesion, unless those contracts violated the antitrust laws. The court made it difficult to prove a patent invalid for indefiniteness, holding that a claim's only indefinite if it's insolubly ambiguous after using all the tools of claim construction. They made uh, the patent, they interpreted the patent venue statutes very generously making it easy for patent holders to choose favorable forums for their lawsuits. They created a high bar for inequitable conduct, making it exceedingly difficult to prove and calling it a plague on the patent system, claims of inequitable conduct. They interposed a duty of care uh, on accused infringers to avoid patent infringement, meaning a party with notice of a patent had to demonstrate affirmative acts to investigate the infringement or validity of the patent, otherwise being declared a willful infringer liable for trouble damages, a presumption of willfulness if you fail to obtain an opinion from your counsel as to non-infringement once you learn of a patent. And if you don't, if you use that opinion of counsel to defend against patent infringement, you waive your privilege and some district courts said not only with the opinion counsel, but with trial counsel. So you have to give away your litigation strategy to the other side if you want to avoid a finding of willful infringement and trouble damages. And the court, the federal circuit all but overruled the reverse doctrine of equivalence, 
which was a doctrine created by the Supreme Court saying that even if there is literal infringement, right, that you can still um, rebut that showing by proving that the accused innovation is a substantial improvement over the essence of the claimed invention. The, the Federal Circuit has all but done away with this, creating what the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals once maligned as the doctrine of literal infringement, whereby infringement is proven merely by the semantic word game of determining that some part of the accused device falls within the literal scope of the claims without regard to whether it's also a substantial improvement operating in a wholly different manner to achieve a wholly different result. That is still virtually gone. And those are some examples. So what happened? Uh, there was an uproar and there were litigation campaigns, right? With um, various parties bringing test cases and trying to get these cases overruled in the Supreme Court and filing amicus briefs and writing articles about a perceived patent thicket and non-practicing entities, which some called patent trolls, asserting patents and impeding true innovation. Whether that's true or not, I'm not <clears throat> here to say, but that was the narrative or the meta narrative that was told and written about, okay? Until in response, the Supreme Court in the 2000s woke up and they became deeply involved with patent law once again, writing more patent law opinions than at any other time since the late 1800s. And I have a chart here which charts this sudden explosion of patent law opinions at the Supreme Court and establishing radical pro-defendant reforms through judicial opinions. Injunctions are no longer automatic under eBay. There, it's easier to invalidate a patent as obvious under KSR. It's either easier to invalidate a patent for failure to recite eligible subject matter under cases like Bilski and Alice, which are now getting some um, opposition and, and criticism, those cases. It's easier to invalidate a patent for indefiniteness under Nautilus. The patent exhaustion doctrine has been reinvigorated. You can't contract around patent exhaustion as easily as before. And we now have international exhaustion. So if you authorize or make a sale of your product overseas, then it can be imported into the US allowing for price competition. And forum shopping has been checked by the Supreme Court under TC Heartland to give a few examples. So I did a study um, recently, there's about five more cases that uh, need to be included in this study, but the majority of the cases issued by the Supreme Court since 2000 established rules to favor accused infringers. As I said, there's five more cases, two favor accused infringers, two favor patent holders, and one establishes a rule that really favors neither party in the given case, all right? So these were far more powerful reforms than anything Congress could do or would do with the warring lobbies of the pharmaceutical industry and the high tech industry pulling it in different directions, its general gridlock, its need to focus on perhaps more important things than patent law, right? Like pandemic, right? Criminal law, there's more important issues, right? And the reforms were mostly in one direction. Now, this period may be drawing to a close. We don't know, either because the law has fallen back into some balance and there's some pushback against it maybe in the eyes of the court, we don't know, or because of radical changes to the court's composition in the last few years. It seems that the outgoing president and the Senate seem to add a justice as often as the outgoing president sends out a tweet, right? So we have three new justices, and, but it's too early to say how these justices view IP. Going in, it was speculated that Justice Gorsuch would favor neither patent holders nor accused infringers. And maybe that's true, although he wrote a strongly worded dissent in a recent case, Thrive Inc. versus Click to Call Tech, where he it's very pro-patent holder, his language. Uh, but I think it's too early for him. Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett, it's too early to tell uh, where they were, will fall on this question. And part of the problem in predicting is that we never get a justice from the federal circuit and sitting circuit court judges who are promoted to the Supreme Court don't hear 
patent cases largely, less in the district court. So I think we'll have to wait and see if this reform era is drawing to a close. Okay, scholars have noticed several different rationales the Supreme Court gives for overruling the federal circuit, that they impose a rigid rule rather than a general standard that they improperly create a special rule for patent law or that they grant insufficient discretion to the district court. My research has, uh, my opinion through, through my research and reading all these opinions is that the most common rationale the Supreme Court gives for reversing the federal circuit is that the federal circuit has ignored or cabined its precedent. And maybe that may seem obvious. Of course, that's why the Supreme Court would reverse a lower court but it's not just any precedent. I've looked at all of these Supreme Court cases and determined that the precedent the court was revitalizing and relying upon and recharacterizing was from those previous areas of Supreme, previous eras of Supreme Court judicial reform, the late 1800s, the 1930s and 40s, all prior to the enactment of the 1952 Act and prior to the 192 creation of the federal circuit. Precedent, to borrow the title of our book, that has often been forgotten, distinguished, or disregarded. Practitioners are often surprised to find a case they had forgotten or thought had been discarded. And so I wouldn't be at all surprised if this era of reform continues, if one day we see the resuscitation of the reverse doctrine of equivalence and the resuscitation of the forgotten Westinghouse case. So in a common law system, forgotten IP precedent or lore is the very grist for the mill of patent law reform. And how do they do it? I've talked about the influences from external forces, litigation campaigns, um, amicus briefs and articles by scholars. And then the judicial reform is affected through the flexible tools of precedent, vitality and stare decisis. Stare decisis is a flexible tool. They're supposed to follow their precedents, right? But they engage in precedent vitality. It's, 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 only, it's deceptively um, a rule of following their precedents because they select which precedents to revitalize and which parts of the precedent to focus on, which precedent to ignore or distinguish. And it's resuscitated lore because the lore because the court recasts the precedent through this selection and interpretation, even as an historian recasts history through selection and interpretation. So closing, closing up, the last point is uh, to think about the fact that judges here make the, the law, as I've suggested, makes urgent the question of what motivates their decision making, because they're not elected directly. And so uh, Judge Richard, Richard Posner, in his book, How Judges Think, tries to collect and describe the multiple theories about what drives or motivates judicial decision making. And he talks about formalism, right? The notion that judicial decisions are objectively forged out of precedent, canons, statutes and the constitution, right? You could think of originalism in this category by dispassionate judges who do their duty even if they disagree with it. So we think of Chief Justice Roberts at his confirmation hearing saying, I have no agenda. It's my job to call balls and strikes and not to pitch or bat. This theory is unpopular among scholars and political scientists of all stripes because judges are necessarily biased, imperfect humans working in a fabric of social constructs and unwitting prejudices using the imperfect tools of language, which itself, as I said, is not a constant referent. Law is not arithmetic. Nonetheless, because formalism is what many judges earnestly proclaim they are doing, maybe we should assume that they at least often consciously make an imperfect attempt, or sometimes. There's the political theory which claims that judges' decisions are explained by their political preferences that they bring to their cases. And there, while there's some data to support this position, it's an incomplete explanation as well. It used to be thought that sometimes Republican presidents appointed judges who drift to a liberal ideology and vice versa, Justice Souter, Justice Stevens. 
This is less so, it seems, in contemporary times because of the brazen politicization and bare knuckles politics of justice selection and confirmation. However, uh, especially in patent law, many cases do not involve high political stakes or pose a conflict between political values, both of which are important to a judge. And at least in the era of patent law, we've seen far more unanimity among the justices than we see dissents. And Gregory Mandel has written about this. Patent law decisions are usually um, almost unanimous. All right, there's the strategic theory, which is somewhat more nuanced than the political theory. This theory posits that the justice, judges and justices vote strategically because sometimes not voting in alignment with their alleged party uh, would be unwise because of the reaction of the other justices, societies, voters, and congresses will be counterproductive to the long-term policy goals. So for example, a conservative Supreme Court might affirm the constitutional right of a woman to medical and bodily privacy in order to avoid a backlash against the anti-choice movement, but continue to enlarge the reasonable restrictions states can put on abortion to the point where the right to choose becomes practically nugatory. There's the sociological theory. It contends that such things as gender, racial, and socioeconomic identity, the small group dynamics of the appellate court, the aversion to triggering dissents and moderation by association with others unconsciously push judges in different policy directions. The economic theory assumes that judges are self-interested utility maximizers um, creating rules like waiver and estoppel and deference to the agencies, limiting appellate review so that they um, do less work. Okay, the psychological theory, which focuses on strategies for coping with uncertainty and highlights the importance and sources of pre preconceptions in shaping judges' responses to uncertainties. Related to that, the phenomenological theory which emphasizes the influence of the conscious psychological experience of being a judge rather than just the unconscious experience. The prag and finally, the pragmatist theory, which holds that judges base decisions on the ultimate policy effects decisions will have in society rather on the legal, than on the legalistic readings of cases and statutes. And there's rich scholarship to support this notion. Um, however, unconsciously judges might be in this task by sociological and psychological influences, they're, af they're often admirably forthright in admitting that policy pragmatism is what they consciously attempt. Justice Vinson wrote, what the court is interested in is the actual practical effects of the disputed decision, its consequences for other litigants and in other situations. So I argue that each of these theories is incomplete, taken alone, and they often overlap with one another in different ways, I tend to think they are all correct and all offer insights into how judges decide. So a common law judge's phenomenological experience is to read the precedent and use it to justify their decisions, except that they may disagree with it and therefore distinguish or disregard it because they also act pragmatically to achieve a certain policy direction or political result in this way, acting strategically to achieve those results, all of which is influenced consciously or unconsciously by sociological and political attitudes and utilitarian self-interests. They are all correct and incorrect in their own ways. The answer is that they are complex human beings, right? And so this is troubling, right? In a democracy where the judicial decisions are not objective um, application of the law to the facts, they're constructs. They recite the facts of cases, they construct them, they can reconstruct the precedent, just like history. Histories are artificial constructs, right? And so the work of historiographers to understand how histories are constructed would be useful here in the future research. Hayden White's identified various literary tropes that are present in histories, the comedy, the tragedy, the romance, are those present in judicial decisions? Would it be possible to code judicial opinions in a particular field and determine if there are similar patterns um, in, in judicial opinions? Or look at a literary theorist like Kenneth Burke in his grammar of motives, 
right? And find out literary patterns in judicial opinions, patterns of act, scene, agent, agency, and purpose. And if you do that, it raises the question of, isn't this all, and this is my final point, isn't this all very undemocratic since the judges are not elected? And so the postmodern insight was that many of the things we think are natural or neutral are artificial constructs, law, justice, even race, gender, history. And in the late 10th, 20th century, the cultural reaction to this realization tended toward rebellion or, or nihilism. So we think of punk rocks and, and drug abuse, right, in that era, okay? Contemporary philosopher John Higgs observes a new attitude, metamodernism, which is the further realization and acceptance of this fact that the world is comprised of artificial and societal constructs, but the further understanding that if constructed and wielded properly, they can be used to affect social good. So I recommend this book, John Higgs, The Future is Here. All right, for example, patent reform that's not dictated by the neutral and can't be dictated by the neutral application of the law or a fair reading of statutes and precedent, but rhetorically constructed as a powerful tool that's far more effective than legislation. But that's only comforting if one's view views patent law reform favorably. If you don't believe that there's a patent thicket or that non-practicing entities are improving true innovation, then you would view the justices' work as perverse and anti-democratic. Not to mention the justices' work or potential work in less mundane and more important areas like constitutional law or criminal law. Would a civil law system be more democratic or would it even be different? I mentioned that I'm not an expert in civil law, but some European scholars have argued that even in these systems, of course there's interpretation by judges, lawmaking, because words must always be interpreted. But Jeremy Bentham criticized the common law as being undemocratic and wrote of it to President James Madison, the common law, the yoke of which in the wordless as well as boundless and shapeless shape of common alias unwritten law remains still about our necks. So, but in our US system, would codification by Congress also be undemocratic given the domination of Congress in the United States by lobbying interests and powerful corporations, the unequal apportioning of voting rights in this country, country of voting influence? Here, California with a population of close to 40 million people gets two votes in the Senate Wyoming, with a population of under 550,000 people, also gets two votes. I tried to do the math. This means that the vote of a resident of Wyoming is roughly 91 times more influential than the vote of a Californian citizen regarding representation in the U.S. Senate, through which all bills must pass. And of course, Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, with over 630,000 people gets zero votes in the Senate. That's not very democratic. That's not equal protection. And the Supreme Court suffers from the same deficiencies of democracy as we've seen in stark relief in recent years when a bare majority of senators elected by a minority of the population have been able to confirm three justices appointed by an outgoing president who lost the popular vote. So I think my answer is that neither judge-made law nor legislation is wholly democratic in this country. Yeah, well, thank you, Sam. This is great. Uh, lots and lots of food for thought there. So uh, well, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, maybe starting from uh, getting around this point about democracy. I mean, uh, I mean uh, we'll, we'll approach it this way. I mean, Let's compare what the court does in patent law with what it does in, in copyright law. Okay. So would you say there's a common law to copyright? Uh, is it operating the same way? Is, I know this is an unfair question because that's not your chapter, but uh, I guess I'm well, being the mean, a mean law professor here, I guess. I'm, I'm not a copyright but, but, scholar. But I'm really trying to test your patent thesis a little bit. That's why I'm asking. So. <laughs> no, no, right. I, that's a good question. I'm not a copyright scholar although I do teach copyright law and I practiced it when I was in practice a little bit. Um, my initial perception is that the copyright statute is a lot, uh, is somewhat more detailed perhaps than the Patent Act. 
But in teaching copyright law, I find as well that the rules um, are developed by the courts um, and there's differences in the circuit and they fill in the, uh, the gaps um, in confounding and often confusing ways, the difference between um, expression and ideas, the uh, substantial similarity test in the right and the different circuits mm -hmm. for copyright infringement. That's judge made law. That's the mm -hmm. meat of sub substance of how you determine infringement through substantial similarity. And it's different in other circuits and it boggles students. They cannot get their heads around it. That's all judge made law, right? So uh, with the caveat that I would want to research that carefully and yeah, read yeah. all of those opinions <laughs> um, more carefully, I would uh, tentatively argue it is it is common law or yeah. it's a common law enabling well, statute. Well, some of the judge made law in the context of infringement is, is not, I guess, not surprising. It's also understandable that I mean, this is, this is um, we expect the courts to create its own rules about how uh, basically how litigation is going to work. Uh, I mean, there'll be procedural rules. We get into this procedure versus substance uh, aspect, but there might be procedural rules that Congress creates for the for the courts. But then, how actual cases get litigated may be up to the courts, and that's not something that Congress. You know, there there is sort of an interesting separation of powers issue there between the the Congress legislating and the courts, you know, adjudicating. Um, but, uh, you know, if you look at other aspects of common law, which I, I think you're right about, I mean, in copyright, for example, there's fair use, uh, which I think I could make the case for as being democratic. I'm sure that will upset probably a lot of our colleagues and a lot of people. I think, I think it's also a sensible argument. It's not a completely uh, crazy argument, but part of what's going on there, it's where the, con the comparison with patent law gets interesting is that in a lot of the copyright cases of fair use, the court is adjudicating against technology in some ways. It's a, adjudicating against the technology of publishing and, and copying. Um, right. um, and I mean against not just simply hostile to the technology, but that's, that's where a lot of the fair use cases come up. And then the courts actually do take a somewhat of a democratic position in the sense that they are speech oriented, transformation oriented, criticism oriented. Uh, patents are interesting. I mean, I have to think this out a little bit about democracy, um, but I, you know, when you compare what goes on with patent law, um, you know, the, the courts, um, let me say the court, the Supreme Court, because we can, I don't want to open up the federal circuit rabbit hole yet. Maybe not, maybe we don't have enough time for any podcast to do that, but, um, but in the, in the patent area, I mean, I think the court is very willing to just defer on the hardcore technical issues to the agency. I mean, there's an agency there that, that operates in a way that the copyright office doesn't. And so the court then is really focusing not so much on the technology, but on the business aspects, the, the invention act. I mean, the, the, those, those activities of entrepreneurs and and business people and scientists and, and, and so forth. And it may be doing that in a, in, in a somewhat democratic way. I mean, here we get into the questions about how science and capitalism relate to democracy. But I mean, I think in some ways, and, and so one example of that, and again, Justice Kennedy may not be representative of anything, but you know, when he talks, for example, in KSR and a number of other opinions, uh, when he appeals to common sense. Right. Um, that strikes me as somewhat democratic. It just maybe Justice Kennedy's, I was going to use the word weirdness. I'll use the word weirdness. You know, that, that's his vibe, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, California, California <laughs> vibe that he has about <laughs> common sense. But I mean, so, you know, how would, how, what would you say about something like that? That, you know, there's, there's this, on the one hand, there is this problem of deferring to the, the technocratic aspects of the, of the patent yeah. office, but then the court comes back and tries to, introduce concepts like common sense in, in, in the law and how things are, yeah. are handled. So to the, yeah, I, I take your point to the extent the court is um, reversing the federal circuit for having overly rigid rules, right? Like the teaching suggestion motivation test and instead 
um, let's let the district court apply various canes of reasoning um, and such as common sense. Um, I can see your point that that is democratic because the federal circuit's rigid rules are really like lawmaking, right? Or code mm -hmm. making, almost like mm -hmm. civil code mm -hmm. making. They're yeah. too detailed and the federal circuit judges are not elected. Um, so I think it's a very good point. It's democratic in that sense. Um, however, it's supplanting um, the federal circuit's rigid rules with other with standards, more flexible standards yeah, that are to yeah. be applied by other unelected district court judges. Um, however, it is democratic insofar as therefore it's more susceptible to the litigation process and to private litigants, I suppose. Um, the, the reforms that I'm talking about are also democratic, and you mentioned this with fair use, but they're, they're democratic insofar as I think they're the result of litigation campaigns and amicus briefs and articles and public outcry. Uh, there's maybe there's something democratic. It's not electoral dem democracy, right? And and also yeah, I would yeah. say it's often funded by powerful interests, right? The high tech yeah, industry, yeah. the pharmaceutical industry. Um, in copyright law, you have litigation campaigns by the wealthy um, copyright industry, you know, like Disney and so forth. But you also have public interest groups who have a huge say. The, the, the fair use right. stat, um, statute, it's a statute, right? The four steps are spelled right. out. But it's also common. I mean, it's also, I mean, the, it's codifying, you know, Folsom right. versus Marsh. It's codifying a common law decision. Right. Right. So, yeah. So it falls it's into cons that it's consistent. It's, it's consistent with what you're saying. Yeah, it codified the common law and, and sets forth the four common right. law consideration, right. but then it's up to the court to interpret and weigh right. them and apply yeah. them and determine that, yeah. you know, transformation is going to be more important than something else. So, yeah, I mean, that, I think part of what's going on when we start talking about democracy in all these different ways and whether the court is, is part of how you think about what, it, what you know, counter-majoritarian means. I mean, some people would say counter-majoritarian is kind of per se undemocratic because democracy is about the will of majorities while other people would say, no, no, democracy is about the will of the people broadly. Yeah. And majoritarianism is sometimes actually minoritarianism, or it may be, you know, a very, very um, oppressive type of majority that in some ways is acting in an anti-democratic way for certain right. aspects of democracy, the, the, maybe the real aspects, real values of democracy, right? Progress, not, not being traditional, not being hidebound, those types of things. And, I mean, I could see how the court is actually being fairly, dumb. I, I mean, I tend to be, um, you, know, it, you know, I'm sort of a John Hardy type person a little bit. I mean, I think it's, it's a little bit too um, sanguine in some cases about how, you know, what the court is doing. But there's, there's, a, there's a point there that, the, that this counter-majoritarian impulse is really about, um, you know, promoting democratic values that arise when the process gets you know, distrustful. Yeah. So and yeah. that may be happening in, in patent law and, and in copyright law when you bring in the, the business interests and the technological interests and all of those types of things. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a balance to be struck and the, the founders um, were concerned about the tyranny of the majority. Um, and so that's why we have these checks, but they were of course elites in society and right, right. of yeah, themselves, yeah. and that's part of the reason why they were uh, worried about the tyranny of the majority. Um, and but there is a balance, and and I, I see what you mean by democratic values, right? The majority might vote against democratic values, right? Yeah. right? Um, but, and, and it meant democratic values, not in like what they thought of what that would be in you know the 18th century, but you know what yeah. we think about it now, post World War II. Et cetera, you know. Right. Um, I think that the balance has gone too far in the other way in our electoral politics because of the electoral college, yeah, because yeah. of the very existence of the Senate, right? Um, that now we have a tyranny of the minority almost, right? Or yeah, I don't know, yeah. tyranny, but it's a we're ruled by the minority at the federal level. The majority of the population has more votes in the Senate right they have more influence on the electoral yeah. college they have more influence on the supreme court so i think the balance 
you know, is is out of whack. <laughs> it's my yeah, no, no, I don't think it's balanced, right? It's not. It's just even kind of odd to call it balance in terms of how the actual political process. I was thinking more about what the courts are trying to do. I mean, I could point out. Yeah. Putting aside the issue of the court being packed with federalist, you know, pretty homogeneous thinkers, putting aside that issue, but but that that's really more where the political process has gone awry. But, you know, the courts have done stuff in the last four years that have mitigated how horrible things were going in, in many that's ways. True. That's we'll right. See, we'll see what happens, you know, with this newly constituted court, but, you know, this, you know, the pendulum has swung again. So some things will happen in terms of the composition of the courts as well, I think. Yeah, so, we're, so. we're holding our breath and waiting to see, um, especially in high pro, some high profile cases, the right. court mitigated the damage like over, you know, they didn't um, invalidate the uh, Affordable Care Act. Right? Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't know if they will. Yeah, but right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, they probably won't going by the oral arguments, you know, maybe they will, uh, you know, abortion rights, um, uh, right? Um, yeah. They haven't wholly thrown them out, right? But, you know, but in the high profile cases that people notice, which makes me think that they're acting strategically because there's the other 70 cases, right, where Justice Roberts has voted with the conservative majority to undermine things that are very important that right, most people right. don't know or write about or get outraged about. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, we'll see how, I mean, it's so, it's so many, the, issue, the interests and the issues are so complicated that, uh, you know, I, I'd hate to almost make a general theory, but it's just interesting to see how it plays out in, in intellectual property or specifically in patents and copyrights, because we can, yeah. you know, th at least the dimensions of the problems are kind of, um, you know, easy to state. You've got the, you know, the technology, science uh, aspect of this, you've got the business side of this, then you've got the various type of, of user groups, educators, you know, creative people, artists, yeah. um, you know, inventors. And so it's interesting to see how the court tries to, you know, triangulate all of that. You know, what are the things about, or quadrangulate, whatever the right word would be. But, um, you know, one of the things also, I liked, I liked the, the ecosystem and the cycle. I mean, you started off and, and so forth. So I just kind of have two points because we probably talked for a while, but it's always always interesting to have these discussions and it's, uh, but where do the where does where do lawyers fit into that I mean these these you know the judges don't just simply decide and so we tend to take a view of this because largely the way we're taught we're taught law by reading appellate opinions and we still are uh, largely but um, you know the court can only respond to the cases that are brought yes so do you have a sense this may be more political science um, more more something that but i mean you're you're a litigator but do you have a sense of how you know this is sort of a law and society question i guess or a law and political science question but how these cases are brought and how that affects the um you know the dynamic of these cases so for example do we find that the federal circuit goes in a way that um that affects certain industries more than others and therefore you know there's more litigation than that comes out of, let's say, the pharmaceutical industry or, yeah. you know, the IT sector, and then that uh, affects the dynamics of the, um, you know, of how the courts are going to rule. Right. I, I think that the courts react to litigation campaigns. Yeah. Um, high profile cases that are brought, that are nourished in the lower courts and brought to the appellate courts. Um, and um, so, for example, with respect to pharmaceuticals, you mentioned the federal circuit is more favorable to pharmaceutical patents than to other patents. They say they're more, it's an unpredictable art. It's more difficult to prove that they would have been obvious, those, those patents. And that's probably because the pharmaceutical industry has an incentive and has the money to fund those appeals. Right and yeah, and yeah. and bring them to the Supreme Court and so unfortunately in patent law you know and then on the other side I think the high tech companies have the money and resources to bring their appeals forward and frame the cases um, for appeal starting in the district court and raise the issues and and do petitions for certiorari and get these questions in front of the court which moves patent law in the opposite direction. 
Mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. then we legal scholars, we write amicus briefs uh, and so forth, um, which is not funded by big money, right? It's right, 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 right. That cloth of uh, academia, right? When, and we're doing it out of um, our passion and our interest. So that's good. But unfortunately in patent law, the issues that are brought up are ones that are heavily funded, which is anti-democratic, I think. I've, yeah, my yeah. sense is that in copyright, it's a better situation that you have. Um, and, and by the way, in patent law, you also have public interest organizations like EFF mm -hmm. that work on this without you know, remuneration and work on these cases. And I said scholars, so it's, there is that side too. In right. patent yes. law, I mean, in copyright law, my sense is that it's a little, a little better that that when there's an outrageous copyright decision, the public interest groups and the scholars rise up and can get those cases before the court and expand the fair use doctrine and and, and so forth. But I would ask you if, if about that, I, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I have any more inside. I guess people have studied this one. I've seen, I guess you have the ProPublica case, you know, yeah. regarding, uh, you know, copyright and, and, and annotated codes that you know does show the role of, of public interest in right. in copyright i mean that was somewhat was a great case uh, it's also a case that you know it's hard to you know the, the argument in favor of the state is largely you know we, we would need to have more revenue or something you know or we, you know there's no real creative interest that's you know that's being really violated on that side I, I, in my opinion but uh yeah. but obviously Breyer and ginsburg thought differently because they you know were willing to, to find in favor of some sort of authorship there. Uh, but I think it was a pretty, you know, pretty straightforward case. I'm not trying to diminish it, I'm just, you know, in terms of public interest, the, it seems like a line on a fairly, you know, easy, yeah. easy path. But even said that, it was a 5-4 decision. So, um, you know, Oracle versus Google is interesting, right? This is where the copyright and patent stuff overlap. Right. Even though it's a pure copyright case, and it's also fair use as well as a copyright subject matter case, so I'm really curious how the court's going to come out there. Um, right, right. And I you mean, have powerful uh, companies on both sides. There's right, no right. It's not, and, a, it may, and it may be even though it's copyright in name, it may be patent in spirit. I mean, yeah. you know, it may be a case where uh, one one of my theories of that case is that there folks who say, oh, software patents have gotten so weak, we need to strengthen copyright in this area. So yeah, that's a pessimistic reading of where that case might come out. But, uh, but you know, it wouldn't be, I don't think I'd be surprised if it, does, it is really just this disguised patent case. Right. Yeah. The yeah. sands constantly shift back and forth. But I, yeah. I think, yeah. I think uh, the last thing, I think these amicus campaigns are good and important. Um, I'm always pleased when I see an amicus brief go around and I read it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's part of the process. It that's, adds some democracy, right? Absolutely, as, yeah. It's, it's, part, of, the it's part of the process, yeah. The judges and the justices read them. I know that, you know, and, they, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're influenced by them. So, it, you know, we need to have our word as academics. And Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, that's part of the, that's part of the process. I mean, that's why when, when you know, a statement about democracy is made, that's why it's important to understand, in my opinion, it's important to understand exactly what that means. Uh, right. You know, if it's just done in terms of, you know, counter counter majoritarianism or whatever, that's taking just the vote view of democracy. Just everybody's right. got one vote. Right. We count up the votes, but it's about process more broadly. And this is part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the amicus briefs and, you know, and the, and the litigation and so forth are part of the democratic process, in, in my opinion. So, um, so, mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead, Eddie. Oh, no, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. So one last uh, comment from you, I guess. So this is totally self-serving for both of us. So uh, what do you want to say about the importance of people knowing about forgotten intellectual property lore? <laughs> uh, uh, why is that important for, 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 for scholars and practitioners in the area of intellectual property? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I don't I, mean I, to try to sell simply this book. I just meant the concept of, let me, let me, instead of saying forgotten intellectual property or meta history, to use your, your, yeah. your terminology. <laughs> well, I, I think that the forgotten intellectual property lore, as I've tried to say, is the seeds of future intellectual property law. So that's what yeah. I've tried to say, that it gets right. resuscitated. Um, and so I think we need to pay attention to it. As I said, the reverse doctrine of equivalence may come back 
someday, right? right? There can, I can see there being litigation campaigns to do that um, from my standpoint. And then the other great thing about the book is I think that U.S. readers and scholars are so focused myopically on the U.S. And it's a great book because it's scholars from all around the world. And it's really useful to read about um, these meta narratives um, in other parts of the world and how the law develops and you know what are the stories they tell. Um, yep. It just opens your mind and, and gives you a better perspective. So I think it's a very important book for that reason. We need to yeah. broaden our horizons generally as as Americans. Right. And just not take a little, go back a little bit on the self-serving part, not just simply about the book, but I think this idea of a concept of lore is important. And I hope, I hope other scholars, you know, pursue it either in a critical way or a more of an affirmative way, whatever they do, I think that hopefully people consider it and think about it. And I want to thank you for spending, you know, a bit over an hour with us to share your important chapter, but also want to thank you for being in this project from the very beginning, both your your really excellent Syracuse a law review article on uh, on Westinghouse and the reverse doctor of equivalence, and your contribution to this book. So thank you, and thank you, Chuba, for including me for this important project. Your other projects, I love your book on exhaustion. Um, with, with Irene Kabuli, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, with your, it's a great book, and uh, all you do for the academy and for young scholars is is great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, and uh, have a great day. Have a great uh, holiday, and I uh, look forward to chatting soon, Sam, hopefully face-to-face. -face. Yeah, I look forward to it, too. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Bye. Bye. So I thought that went well. I hope you were happy with it. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. It was really good. It was a lot of fun, and I'll look forward. It's going to go on YouTube, right? Yeah, it's going to go on YouTube. I'll have the I'm still recording this. I should turn off the recording. But in any oh. case, that's that's fine. We won't say anything. <laughs> but uh, uh, this would be like the uh, whatever those things are called in uh, on DVDs. The uh, 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 I forget the name of them right now. <laughs> the outtakes or whatever. Or the blooper. Oh, okay. This will be, right, this will be right. part of the webcast blooper reel or something. <laughs> but yeah, this will be on uh, this will be on uh, on the YouTube channel hopefully later today, and I'll send you a link and I'll. Uh, post a series of them. There, there's a whole series now. I'll, I'll post that probably on IP Profs and, and you know, distribute it on YouTube and um, Twitter and Facebook and things like that. Okay. And we'll post it as well if it's all right with you. Yeah, great, great. I might keep this ladder, even though we're still recording now. I think it's kind of funny to have these sort of out of character <laughs> <laughs> yeah. discussions. Okay. Well, have a great holiday. I'll, uh, I'll hope to talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, take care. Bye.